Hello, brothers and sisters. It's Brother McKay, and welcome to your in-service this week. Um, there's a scripture of mine that's a favorite in 2 Nephi chapter 25, verses, verse uh, 23. You probably know this one. For we labor diligently to write, to persuade our children, and also our brethren, to believe in Christ and to be reconciled to God. For we know that it is by grace that we are saved, after all we can do. This verse makes me think of you laboring diligently every day to persuade your children or the children of your seminary class to believe in Christ and be reconciled to God. It's the second half of this verse that's famous, for we are saved by grace after all we can do. And a lot of times as members of the church, we wrestle with this idea of what's all we can do. And sometimes we get criticized for trying to earn grace after all we can do. But let me uh, share with you this idea. In the scriptures, there's a lot of parallels. And so we write and labor diligently or teach diligently to persuade our children to do two things. Um, believe in Christ. Okay? And reconcile themselves to God. And so this is what, now, why do we do this? For we know. That's, the, that's this injunction here. For we know. Well, what do we know? Well, we know we need to believe in Christ because it's by grace that we are saved. Okay? So we are saved by grace because of Jesus Christ. Now, what is the work we need to do? Well, if in the scriptures are parallel, then Christ get, brings us grace. What we are trying to do is reconcile ourselves to God. And so for all we can do is work on this reconciliation. So this is our work, and then because of his work, we have this grace that comes to work with us. Now let me tell you what, read to you what the word reconciliation means. To reconcile is to call back into union and friendship the affections which have been alienated. To restore to friendship or favor after estrangement. To bring to acquiescence, content, or quiet submission. To reconcile oneself to afflictions. So that, that is a deep, difficult work, the work of reconciliation. We are alienated. Um, we don't want afflictions, and yet we are trying to submit ourselves to afflictions. As we do this work, we discover grace. Um, that's why we have to have Christ in all of this equation. There is no reconciliation without Jesus Christ. And Chad Webb, over the summer, commissioned us to put Christ in the center of our teaching. And he quoted Elder Hales from five years ago in General Conference. Elder Hales said, In recent decades, the church has largely been spared the terrible misunderstandings and persecutions experienced by the early saints. It will not always be so. The world is moving away from the Lord faster and farther than ever before. You see the lack of reconciliation? The adversary has been loosed upon the earth. We watch, hear, read, study, and share the words of prophets to be forewarned and protected. For example, the family, a proclamation to the world, was given long before we experienced the challenges now facing the family. The living Christ, the testimony of the apostles, was prepared in advance of when we would need it most. And so, Nephi, a few verses later, summarizes saying it, that it's um, we talk of Christ, we rejoice in Christ, we preach of Christ, we prophesy of Christ, we write according to the prophecies that our children may know to what source they may look for remission of their sins. And so Chad Webb has asked us to every single day bring Christ into our teaching. And so he's given us four different ways to do this. First, he asks us to focus on titles, roles, characters, and attributes of Jesus Christ. And as we focus on these titles and roles, this will help us to get to know him and get to know who he is and, and what he does. He asks us to emphasize the example of Jesus Christ. We teach principles, but Christ is the embodiment of all principles. Um, sometimes it's difficult to do the things that we're saying to do. It's much easier to follow someone's example. And so we look to Christ's example of how to do these things. Look for types and shadows of Jesus Christ. In the scriptures, we're constantly telling stories about 
prophets and apostles and saints and sinners. But a lot of these times, these people are types and shadows of Christ. And so as we connect our students to Christ through the lives of others, they will feel a stronger connection and, and it'll be easier for them to recognize Christ in their own life. And finally, bear, bear pure testimony. Bear a more frequent, a more reverent testimony of Jesus Christ. And as we do that, we will increase frequency of Christ in our class. Now, this isn't new work. This isn't more work. In fact, this fits n right into the work we're already doing. Do you remember this? Okay, the fundamentals of sequential scripture study. And as we teach the scriptures, we are trying to understand context and content, identify doctrines and principles, understand the meanings of doctrines and principles, feel and apply. Now look, these are outcomes to be achieved. So these aren't the methodologies. We want understanding. We want to see clearly. We want to understand more, mean, more deeply, and we want to feel something, and ultimately we want to become something. Well, if you look, these are the outcomes. Look how easily we can produce these outcomes here. As we are understanding context and content, why don't we focus on titles and roles and characters and attributes of Jesus Christ in the context, in the content? Um, as we, after we identify doctrines and principles, well, what better way to emphasize that doctrine and principle by looking to Christ and following his example? If we're trying to feel the importance of these things, well, then we can look into the lives of others and see Jesus Christ in their lives. Or we can come solicit more frequent, solemn, and reverent testimony from our students on who Jesus Christ is. And all of these things will ultimately um, produce these outcomes of greater understanding um, and, and a, a deeper feeling of who Jesus Christ is and what these things mean to us and how we might follow him. Brother Webb taught it this way. He said, pondering examples of the Lord in his roles as Jehovah, the mortal Christ, and the resurrected Savior will increase our students' power and capacity to take effective righteous action. It'll take our lessons beyond discussions about ethics and self-mastery and connect students to the power of the Savior and the eternal plan of happiness. <sighs> Did you notice that? Brother Webb is talking about increased power and strength to do things. Well, ultimately, we want to apply all of these teachings so that we can become and take effective righteous action, all right? And so as we're helping our students to take effective righteous action, this, they need strength, they need power. Well, what's another way for, for word for strength and power in the gospel? The enabling power of the atonement, according to the Bible dictionary, is grace. So we need Jesus Christ in order to feel and understand grace. Now, what's the work that we do till we get to that point? Well, we are to reconcile, okay? Well, what are we doing here? As we climb this ladder, we are reconciling ourselves to God. We're understanding and identifying his principles. And as we get closer and deeper and feel the truth and importance of those principles, we can see the grace of God and it strengthens us and enables us to do things that maybe we wouldn't normally be able to do on our own. And that is the definition of grace. So, um, a lot of you are teaching section three of the Doctrine and Covenants this week. And as I went through, I tried to apply Brother Webb's things here. And as I was understanding the context and content of section three of the Doctrine and Covenants, um, I came upon verse six or I'm sorry, verse 15. And as I was reading verse 15, focus, titles, roles, characters, and attributes of Jesus Christ. See if you can pick it out. For thou hast suffered the counsel of thy director to be trampled upon from the beginning. Who is thy director? If you look in the footnotes 15a, i.e. the Lord. Jesus Christ is the director. Now can you see it as we identify who the director is? and what that might mean, and that all the things you can do with your students to understand what, how Christ is our director. And so I looked up the word director, 
in the dictionary, and it says, one who superintends, governs, or manages, one who prescribes to others by virtue of authority, an instructor or a counselor. And so immediately all of those words mean something to me. Now we make Christ our director. I might ask questions like, what direction is your life going right now? Um, Christ, I would ask the question of uh, what authority or who is directing my life? And then I would follow it up with, do I want Christ as my director? If I give someone a, a to superintend means to give someone authority, or it even means this, to have exercise or charge over, or oversight over. Would I want Christ as my superintendent? Would I want him to be in charge of me? And if he was in charge of me, what would he be telling me, or what direction would he tell, be telling me to go right now? So you can already see how Christ as the director might help us to get direction or come find grace in our lives. Um, so you're going to be in section three, and I want you to focus on verse eight. As you reach in, into the teacher's manual, you'll see that you're going to have students read verse eight silently. They're going to pick out a principle. Once they identify that principle, um, I want you to use the example of Jesus Christ to help your students understand the meaning of the principle found in verse eight. Okay, so that's your task. Use Jesus Christ's example to help students understand the meaning of the principle found in verse 8. And you'll see what that is in your teachers. You know. Others of you are going to be in section 17. And in verse 6 of section 17, the Lord bears his testimony of the Book of Mormon. And so what I want you to do is use the Savior's testimony of the Book of Mormon to help your students connect to their own testimony of the Book of Mormon. Um, so look for this, this shadow or this type of, of Jesus Christ where he, he bears his testimony and what does that mean for your testimony and make that connection um, to your students and, and see how using Christ to teach these principles and doctrines in the Doctrine and Covenants um, increases the reconciliation um, and increases the grace of God in your class. Um, I have a testimony. There are misunderstandings and persecutions on the horizons. Just as we've felt the misunderstandings of our doctrines and teachings on the family, there will be new misunderstandings and new persecutions focused on Jesus Christ and our testimony of him. Um, it's my hope and prayer that you will labor diligently to put Christ at the center of your teaching. And as you do so, the outcomes we desire will increase dramatically. And you will see a greater power and ability in your students to do hard things, to do the work of the Lord and to do His will. Thank you for your diligence in laboring to teach these students early in the morning. We love you and I look forward to having many discussions about your success. And I say this in the name of Jesus Christ. Amen.